Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to continue my 8B journey and if you don't know what I'm talking about feel free to watch my last video. In this video I'll show how I took care of this good old VIC-20 machine, which seemed to work but obviously saw its better days. The housing was dirty, quite yellowed and didn't seem to sit tight anymore. I also was quite excited to take a closer look at the mainboard to see if there is also some work waiting. As I told before, I have little overall experience with 8-bit computers and zero experience with any models of Commodore PCs. For this exciting time travel to the roots, I read quite a lot of documentation, blogs and forums, as well as watched a lot of videos to gain some knowledge about the architecture of this computer. However, I never opened nor repaired one myself before, so I had to be careful and remember every cable and screw to be able to reassemble everything properly. Luckily, these parts are very simply made and there are not many things you can do wrong. At the first glance, everything looked quite good. The mainboard didn't seem to have any modifications and was very clean. On the back side, however, I found a loose capacitor, hanging only with one leg on the mainboard. In my last video, probably you've seen that the video signal quality of this device was very poor, and since this capacitor was located near the output connector right underneath of the VIC chip, which is also responsible for the video output, I thought that this loose capacitor could be responsible for the issues. More than that, since it was the only one capacitor on the backside, it looked like a custom modification for me. However, after some investigation I found that this capacitor is always placed there on all VIC-20s with this mainboard. The circuit around the VIC chip located under the RF shield looked also very clean and didn't show up with any surprises. After a brief visual check, I started to clean the housing. Inside of the case, there were some blots of brown gunk. I still don't want to know what it was, but I hope it was just coffee. After removing the keyboard, I started to disassemble it by removing the caps. It worked just fine for the first two keys, until I got to the shift key. This was the place where I made my first error. As I told before, I never disassembled such thing before and I didn't realize, neither did I pay attention, that the keys are held asymmetrically. I thought that all keys are inserted into the keyboard around its middle point. But I was wrong, since the wider keys are displaced and you have to take it into account when trying to pull them off. For me, it meant a broken key and I had to find a replacement. Well, lesson learned, let's move on. Washing the parts was just a straightforward task. Warm soap water and sponge did a great job. To remove the brown gunk, however, I had to take a brush. As you can see, the housing turned out to be very yellowed, especially if you look at it by sunshine. So I decided to retrobrite it a little bit. There are already plenty of videos about it, so I'll skip the details. I didn't want to remove the Commodore sticker from the case, because I was afraid to damage it. So I just put some tape over it in the hope to protect it from chemical reaction. Luckily, we had a warm sunny day and the whole procedure of retrobriting took only 3 hours. During the retrobriting I turned back to the mainboard, first removing the dust and then cleaning everything with alcohol. Meanwhile, I found a replacement for the broken key stamp and reassembling the keyboard itself went without any issue. One thing I had to do though, the broken off shift key still had a plastic piece sticking inside. I couldn't get it out with tweezers, nor with any other tool, so I decided to use a drill and gently get the hole clean again by drilling into the broken plastic part. Luckily, it worked well, however, I had to work very carefully because it was a easy task to get a new key stamp, but to find a key cap is nearly impossible. With a little help of my wife and a keyboard layout image, putting back the key caps took just a couple of minutes.
Meanwhile, it was time to check out how the sun and peroxide worked on the plastic parts. After a little bit of washing and drying, the VIC-20 housing looked as good as new. Yellowing almost vanished and I could barely see the white spots now. It turned out quite good and I am more than happy with the result. The piece of tape also did the job and protected the Commodore sticker flawlessly. As you probably saw in my last video, I got a C64 beside of this VIC-20 to play with. I also cleaned that one off camera in parallel. And as I disassembled the keyboard for that one, I realized that the spring for the spacebar has more tension than a spring for any other smaller key. I didn't take this in account as I reassembled the keyboard for the VIC-20 and after pressing some keys I found that the key V went harder than the other keys. The 4 spacebar was definitely too soft, so I changed the springs for these two keys accordingly. The next point in my list were holders on the back side of the housing. Normally, there are three pairs of them. Unfortunately, they are broken by design since they are quite thin and all thin plastic parts tend to break off. So I measured the sizes and made a simple 3D model of new holders using Blender. They will be hopefully more robust, since I made them a lot wider than the original ones. The VIC-20 seemed to be technically completely okay, however I was not very happy about the image quality, so after I took care about the housing, I decided to replace some capacitors and see if something improves. I ordered some new electrolytic capacitors and replaced the old ones. I also fixed the loose capacitor on the back side of the main board. Unfortunately, all the work replacing the capacitors was obviously not necessary since the image didn't improve at all. However, after asking around and watching some videos and screenshots on the internet, I found that this bad image quality was totally normal and Tweak 20 works just as bad with the modern TFT displays. You almost can't do anything about it without really modifying the circuits and I didn't want to do that, leaving everything in original state. And this was actually it. After putting everything back together, I got a beautiful shiny Commodore VIC-20 at its best. Just to summarize, I cleaned everything to the last screw, replaced the capacitors, retro brighted heavily yellowed plastic parts and fixed the broken case holders. I'm very happy with the result and ready to play around with this nice toy. But maybe this will be something for another video. So far, I hope you enjoyed this video. I learned some things about internals of the Commodore VIC-20 and hopefully you could take something with you too. Thank you and goodbye.